Author Jerry Coyne is clear. Science and religion are simply not compatible. And he's here now to tell us why. Here's Jerry Coyne, author of Faith Versus Fact, Why Science and Religion Are Incompatible. He's also professor of ecology and evolution at the University of Chicago. And um, Professor Coyne, it's good to have you on the program again. We had you once on before via satellite from Chicago, but it's nice to have you in that chair. Good to be back. Thanks for being here. Uh, let's, I'm not pretending this is the most uh, unique question you've ever been asked, but uh, I'm always curious. Uh, why did you feel the need to write this book? Well, it started with my first book, Why Evolution Was True, which was basically an a-religious exposition of the evidence for evolution. And I thought, well, if people learned what the evidence was and how many fields of science it was drawn from and how multifarious it was, that they would surely accept it. But as I went around touring and talking about the book, I faced a lot of pushback from people. And one guy whose story I recount in that book came up to me after one of my talks and said, well, Dr. Klein, I'm, I'm found your evidence very convincing, but I'm still not convinced. And that got me thinking, um, well, why would somebody find something convincing and not be convinced? And I realized it was he had religious blinders on, which prevented him from receiving my message. And I started to realize then, well, I should have realized it because most anti-evolutionism in America comes from religion, that people, if they're brought up with a strict literalist agenda, simply won't accept any evidence at all. And then um, in a subsequent talk in the same tour, I, a woman got out of, up out of the audience and she was weeping and tears were running down her face. And she said, well, Dr. Quinn, I believe everything you said about evolution. I mean, your evidence is incontrovertible but my church tells me it's not true. What do I do about this? And I didn't know what to do. I sort of said lamely, well, I'd go speak to your spiritual advisor. Um, many people can comport science and religion. But then I began to wonder, well, how do they do that? And I started reading the literature on the you know, science and religion relationship, and I realized that a lot of it was fallacious or um, tendentious, and eventually that research grew into that book. So. You're clearly not religious now, but were you ever? Yeah, I was raised as a reformed Jew, but if you're in the States, you know that's about that far from being an atheist. <laughs> I went to Hebrew school briefly, flunked out, and I had a, a deconversion experience when I was listening to Sgt. Pepper album. You're, you're not being facetious. I know, you said no, this no, in the book. No, no, it's in the book, yeah. I don't... The don't, Beatles turned you off religion. Yeah, they, well, and it's nothing that they said or did. I was Maybe it put me in some kind of frame of mind when I was listening to this album that... I still remember it like it was yesterday. I was lying on the couch, and all of a sudden I really realized that everything that I had been taught about God, that there was no evidence for that. And so my very first deconversion experience was an evidence-based one. And I had five minutes of sort of psychic pain when I realized, oh, I'm not going to go to heaven. I'm going to be interred and turned into worm food. And then after that, I've been you know, a non-believer ever since, and it's been OK. And so, you were 17 when that happened? Yeah, it was in. I think 17. The album was 1966, so it would have been 17, I think. And would that be the moment where you really began to see friction between no, science no, and religion? Not at all. Um, you know, basically, I became a non believer, but I didn't do anything about it. I mean, I wasn't vociferous. I didn't argue with anybody. I just didn't make, you know, the divine part of my life. It was only when I wrote my first book and began to face pushback from religious people about my science that I began to realize, well, you know, the problem is not a lack of. Um, evidence for Americans. Evidence is everywhere. We have Neil deGrasse Tyson, David Attenborough, Richard Dawkins, you know, all these people promulgating evolution. You're soaked in science in America. It's the religion that prevents people from accepting it. And I began to realize that the bigger problem is not a lack of education, but a set of blinkers installed on certain people by their religion that makes them resistant to science. Not just evolution, but many other forms of science and rationality in general. Not every scientist, though, sees a conflict between religion and science. We had Martin Rees on this program not Correct. that long ago, a uh, very highly regarded scientist out of the United Kingdom. He does not see any conflict between religion and science, but you clearly do. How come? Yeah, well, it depends on what you mean by conflict. I mean, if you construe a lack of conflict as meaning that there are religious scientists, I think Martin Rees is actually an agnostic. I don't think he's a believer, but he thinks there's no conflict. If you construe harmony between science and religion is the presence of religious scientists, of which, of course, there are many, or the presence of many religious people who like science, of which there are many, then there's no conflict. But that's not what I mean by conflict between science and religion. It's a conflict between how you justify and come to have confidence in what you believe or what you know. 
have you come to believe that there are some religions in the world that are actually very compatible with science? The ones that rely less on the supernatural, of which there are not that many. It's a short um, list. The Jains, for example, uh, Confucianists, Unitarian Universalists, who are, as far as I can see, as close to being atheist as a secular Jew. Um, those people use religion mostly to bolster a sense of community and, and comedy amongst their fellows. They don't really have any beliefs in the supernatural. And it's those beliefs in the supernatural that um, are the things that really come in conflict with the scientific point of view. We've got uh, the results here of a 2009 poll by the Pew Research Center, which is a pretty reputable outfit, I think. And here's what they had to say. 83% of the American public believe in God, whereas 33% of scientists believe in God. Mm -hmm. So, Jerry, you're pretty anti-American to begin with here, I guess, right? Well, I'm not representative of the average American <laughs> in that respect, yeah. Uh, what do you think accounts for this rather broad disparity between what the general American public thinks and what you scientists believe? Well, there's two explanations for that. I'm not sure we know the answer for sure. Being a scientist, I have to confess when I have my doubts. But uh, the first one is that people who are not believers are drawn to science as a profession. So we're enriched with non-believers from the outset. The other explanation, and I think both of these actually apply, is that as you become a scientist, as you learn to instill in your psyche the habits of doubt, of questioning, of demanding evidence for what you believe, you basically give up the childish things that represent the supernatural and the divine. Well, so, except that 33% of those surveyed who are scientists do believe. What would you say to them? That's true. Um, I would say that you're in a state of cognitive dissonance, that when you go to church, you leave at the church door all the habits of rationality, criticality, and doubt that you that you use when you enter your laboratory. When you enter your laboratory, you abandon all of the supernatural beliefs that you hold in church. So you're using two different kinds of evidence for what you believe, one for your scientific beliefs and one for your religious beliefs. And I, I just don't find that as, that's my notion of what incompatibility is. What if, and I have no idea, but what if that 33% merely thinks, you know, I don't have evidence for a higher being. I can't say that I believe because I'm following a line of logic or I'm following it, et cetera. But I'm modest enough to think that it's possible and that, and that I don't know everything. I mean, is that a possible explanation? Yeah, I mean, in my book, I mentioned the kind of evidence that would convince me that there was not only a God, but a Christian God. But to say that, you know, you're so humble that you will believe anything seems to me an extraordinarily degree, extraordinarily high degree of being credulous. I mean, you, people don't say, um, humble enough that I won't dismiss Santa Claus or Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, hmm. for which there's equally little evidence for the, as there is for the divine. It's only religion that has this unique position of people saying, well, we don't have any evidence really for it, but gonna I'm not going to anyway. dismiss it. Yeah, right. I think it's because they have an emotional commitment to those beliefs. Hmm. Kenneth Miller, professor of biology, Brown University, wrote in his 2009 book, Finding Darwin's God, the following. To be sure, genuine faith requires from its adherents a trust in God, but it also demands a confidence in the power of the human mind to investigate, explore, and understand the evolving nature of God's world. If a scientist believes God created the world and science is the study of that world, where's the conflict? Well, the conflict is in what gives you the confidence. That I mean, if you read that part again, he says that it's a kind of faith, analogous to religious faith. But science, I mean, scientists don't have faith that we're gonna understand the world. We have a set of tools that has been employed over 500, 600 years that has been successful. <laughs> so the faith that science has is not the same kind of faith that religious people have, which is basically, as described in Hebrews, it's the assurance of you know, things you have not seen, the conference and things you don't, that you don't have any evidence for. We have faith in science because the methods that we use have produced results, whereas the religious ways of knowing, as you know, because every religion has a different set of truths that they hold, and they're all in conflict with one another, they haven't arrived at any universal or generally accepted truths about nature. There are those who make room for religion, and uh, let's, let's get into that expression right now. I think you call it accommodationism. Yes. What does that mean? To me, it means the view that science and religion are mutually compatible, in the, that they can be admitted together, that they can live harmoniously together in the human mind. And my contention is that that's a point of view which is false, that it's two, way, two different ways of looking at the universe that are not compatible. Who are the accommodationists today? 
Well, there's a lot of them. I mean, every science-friendly religionist, every scientist who is religious is um, an accommodationist because they have these two different ways of looking. There are also many scientific organizations um, issue statements saying that science and religion are not incompatible. You know, we're, we're two separate magisteria, they call them, that one of them dealing with values and morals, the other dealing with the natural world. Um, and so many atheists are accommodations because if we're interested, for example, in selling evolution to an evolution-resistant American public, and you know, more than half of the American public, the US public, doesn't like evolution, then they say, we have to placate our religious friends by telling them that science and religion are not at odds with their faith. And that way they'll be on our side, that way they'll accept evolution. The problem is that that strategy doesn't work very well. That's just politics though, isn't it? It is, and, and in their more candid moments, they'll admit this is a tactical method rather than something they really believe in their hearts. Let's quote another scientist. You may have heard of this guy, Albert Einstein. He seemed to accommodate or at least make room for religion when he wrote in 1932, the most beautiful and deepest experience a man can have is the sense of the mysterious. It is the underlying principle of religion as well as of all serious endeavor in art and science. He who never had this experience seems to me, if not dead, then at least blind. To sense that behind anything that can be experienced there is a something that our minds cannot grasp, whose beauty and sublimely reaches us only indirectly, this is religiousness. In this sense, I am religious. What's your view on that? Well, that's a, yeah, I mean, people always quote Einstein saying that <laughs> because Einstein is regarded as the world's smartest man. And if he says that he's religious in any way, that somehow justifies religion. But what he means by that, and that's borne out by the whole history of his statements on religion, including those in um, Walter Eisenberg's uh, biography of Einstein. Um, he was, he did not believe in a personal God or any kind of theistic God that could intervene in the world. He said that very clearly. Um, a rabbi once wrote to him saying, do you believe in God? And Einstein said, no, you know, no way do I believe in, in any kind of personal God. He, Einstein construed religiousness in the sense of the mysterious, the, what you can't understand. At that time, Einstein was grasping with, grappling with quantum mechanics, these really, really mysterious and you know, counterintuitive things that still boggle the minds of physicists. And when a scientist has a big, juicy, unresolved problem like that, that whose answer may never be known, then it conjures up in you, well, I mean, that's what he called religious. So to say that Einstein somehow justified Christianity or Judaism or whatever from a statement like that is to misconstrue what he was really meaning as awe before the stuff that we don't understand as scientists. Walter Isaacson, who was a guest on this program about six months ago, would yes, want Isaac me to clarify that it was he who wrote the book about uh, Einstein, not Isaac Berg. Yeah, sorry, yes. I get the names mixed that's up. Fine. So. That's fine, that's fine. Okay, let's do another one here. Um, the late evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould, mm -hmm. whom you knew, I'm sure. Yes, he was on my thesis committee. So. Okay, his idea that science and religion do not overlap, he wrote as follows. Science and religion are not in conflict, for their teachings occupy distinctly different domains. The lack of conflict between science and religion arises from a lack of overlap between their respective domains of professional expertise, science in the empirical constitution of the universe, and religion in the search for proper ethical values and the spiritual meaning of our lives. The attainment of wisdom in a full life requires extensive attention to both domains. This is, I mean, you think he's wrong, but why do you think Absolutely. he's wrong? Absolutely. I mean, I go into it again in the book. It would. Uh, basically for two reasons. First of all, he limits religion to meanings, morals, and values. He mm -hmm. says that explicitly in his yep. book. Religionists have, and theologians have not reacted well to that because they will say explicitly that we are basing our religion on certain assertions about the real world that are true. Mm -hmm. For Christianity, it's that Jesus was the Son of God, came to earth and was resurrected. For Jews, it's other things. For Hindus and Muslims, it's, it's other claims. So it's not just about meaning, morals, and values. It's about those things and the sense of community, but they're grounded on certain truths about the world. So by and large, that claim that religion is restricted to this domain has been rejected, not by scientists, but by theologians mm -hmm. who have rejected Gould's claim. The other claim that Gould makes, which is that religion is the purview of beating morals and values, is also wrong because he neglected the fact that there's a huge history, a long history of secular analyses of philosophy and ethics, beginning with the ancient Greeks, going through Kant, Hume, Spinoza, 
John Stuart Mill and all the way up to people like Anthony Grayling and Peter Singer today who deal with ethics, meanings, morals, and values without ever mentioning the supernatural or a deity. So Gould, you know, defined these realms to be separate, but when you actually look at how they operate, they're not. There's considerable overlap. Faith is striking back against, um, well, let me put it this way. I don't think there's too many rabbis, priests, ministers, or imams who are on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday going to be saying, go out and buy Jerry's book. It's a great oh, read. Yes, correct. Um, scientism mm -hmm. is with us now. What is that? Well, scientism is, it's a pejorative word. Mm -hmm. If you look it up in the, uh, I think it's in the Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy, it's, it says right off the bat, this is a pejorative term. It's meant to do down science. And it's, it's, it can be construed as a number of things. The most common is that science extends its reach beyond its ambit. For example, that science will tell you what's ethical. You know, they act in ways that go beyond the bounds of understanding the natural world. So some, you know, the problem is that these construals of science, or that, for example, that, that literature is meaningless or art is meaningless, or we can only understand literature and art through science. That's another way that scientism is defined. But when you actually look at how the word is used, I think we can plead not guilty in general to that. I mean, I, for one, have no problem saying that science can't tell us anything about what's right or wrong. It can tell us what is. There are a few people who disagree with me, like Alex Rosenberg, but by and large, we can't do that. As far as the arts and literature, I'm a big fan of art and literature and music. My, my contention is they can't tell us what's true about the real world. I mean, you can't learn anything about the nature of the cosmos by reading War and Peace, but you can immerse yourself in the fellow feeling of humans and stuff like that. So, you know, um, scientism is just a way that religious people try to denigrate science. Um, and there's a, other ways that's construed as well, but those are the two main ways. And Francis Collins, current director, National Institutes of Health, says science is not the only way of knowing. Are there other ways of knowing? Yeah, I consider this again in my book very deeply because that was the, the question that plagued me the most, the one I had to think the hardest about. Can we learn anything about the universe from what I call science broadly construed, which is not just the activities of the professional scientist, but um, the kind of science that an auto mechanic um, uses when he tries to find out where the short is in your car or a plumber, the, the combination of reason and empirical investigation and testing and things like that. Is there anything that can be found out about the universe beyond that notion of science broadly construed? And my answer was no, I couldn't think of anything. And I posed this question to English professors as well. Can you tell me anything that we can learn about the real world that's verifiable from literature alone, from music alone, from art alone? And I could never find a yes answer. I mean, you can find hypotheses in literature. You can read Moby Dick and learn how whales are hunted, but you know, that comes from empirical experience of Herman Melville. He watched whales be killed. So you don't really, you know, that requires verification. There's plenty of stuff in literature was simply made up. And you know, so, you know, if you took that as fact, just because it's in a novel, which of course is my view of the Bible, a fictional work, which many people think is fact, then you'd be grossly misled. And if, Go ahead. Well, well, let's go full circle here. You yeah. started by saying you wrote this book because the last book that you wrote was unpersuasive enough with enough people. Now you've written the second book. Yeah. If, if people are immune to what you would call evidence or facts, what's the point? Because I think the underlying problem is the problem of faith as a virtue in America. Um, if I were to characterize the difference between science and religion, I'd say, in religion, faith is a virtue, in science, it's a vice. Hmm. So the, I don't think everybody's immune to that. I mean, I made enough converts for my first evolution book, and I get emails to vouch for that, that I know not everybody is immune to it. What I'm hoping with this book is to disabuse Americans, particularly the ones on the fence and the young ones, not the ones who are already deeply steeped in faith, that faith is no way of knowing anything. I mean, it may be a way of making you feel better, but if you're making statements about the afterlife, the nature of the divine, um, particularly when those statements are cause pain, like the church's opposition, many churches' opposition to the use of birth control, the Catholic Church's statement that condoms don't prevent AIDS, the opposition to vaccinations and medical care by many religions like Christian science. In that case, faith is not only not harmless, it's, it's injurious. You actually anticipated my next question, yeah. which is if somebody wants to say that science and faith are compatible, what's the harm in that? That's the answer. Yeah, well, yeah, in many ways. I mean, to me, the rational way of living, which 
is the rational way of living is to base your beliefs and your conclusions as strongly as possible and proportionate to the evidence behind them. So when you make claims like gay, being gay is a choice, which is based purely on religious claims, not on biology, and then prosecute gay people for that, that's harm. Um, thousands of children in America have died because their parents refused to accept medical care on biblical grounds. How many lives does it take before it convinces us that this kind of faith is, is a harmful thing? Do you, think, yeah, sorry, do you think you're winning the argument? Yeah, I think there's no doubt about that. If you look at the statistics, and again, this comes from the Pew Organization, America is becoming slowly but inexorably more secular. So now we're up to 19% of nuns, which are those people who don't, aren't formally affiliated with church. That's almost a doubling in the last 20 years, I think. Um, so I think it won't happen in my lifetime that we will see America arrive at a state similar to that of Northern Europe, which is mostly unbelievers at all. Uh, America in general, maybe, but how about the Republican Party in particular? Well, they're a harder case, but <laughs> you know they're going to come around eventually. It's going to take a couple hundred years. It took a couple hundred years in Europe from the Enlightenment, and now Northern Europe is largely. I mean, when people say religion's always going to be with us, it's here to stay. My answer is Scandinavia, <laughs> because those countries, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, are mostly made up of atheists. They've managed to dispense with religion and still keep their sense of meaning, morals, and values. People aren't running amok in Stockholm. <laughs> They've managed to jettison the superstition but keep the humanistic values. And I think that and the statistics bear me out on this, is what's happening in the United States. Jerry A. Coyne has been our guest. The name of the book is Faith Versus Fact, Why Science and Religion Are Incompatible. It's good to have you here at TVO today. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.